Hello and welcome to Speaking Spirit, where we talk about all things spiritual. Your host, John Moore, is a shamanic practitioner and spiritual teacher. And now, here's John. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. As I am recording this right after the new year, I wish to I wish to wish you a happy new year, a happy 2022. And um I've made a prediction for 2022 that I think things are going to look up on a global scale. Um and what I mean by that, having been through now a couple of years of the pandemic and everyone feeling so isolated and, um, you know, detached from one another, I think things are going to change this year. I'm not exactly sure how um, we're going to come be able to come together more. Maybe that comes through, <clears throat> pardon me, maybe that comes through... Um, new uh, treatments for COVID, making things safer. Maybe that comes through new ways of coming together virtually or what have you. But I believe it's going to, I th- I believe things are going to get better this year. I've done a little uh, looking ahead, so to speak, and seen what is probable for us. And I think, um, you know, I don't, don't like to fully predict the future a whole lot because I do believe in free will and I've done a couple of episodes on divination, one specifically on divination and free will. So I'm not going to say how necessarily things are going to get better, but they they are. They're going to get better this year. I think it's going to happen. It, it looks like things, there's going to be some changes, some turnaround around springtime. So Something to look forward to. Given that we're in the beginning of the new year, and a lot of people, I don't know if this is true in every country or if this is mostly a U.S. thing, but um, a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. Uh, they make goals for the new year. I'm How am I going to... A lot of things are usually around changing themselves, Um Particularly, there can be a lot of goals around fitness. Um, You know, if you watch television or (laughs) go on the internet or anything, you're going to get bombarded with advertisements for gyms and fitness equipment and all kinds of stuff. But what do we know? What do we know about? um, Well, you know, these resolutions, what we know about them is that most of them fail, and most of them don't last longer than a few months, right? I'm going to get into shape, I'm going to start going to the gym regularly, I'm I'm going to run regularly, I'm going to meditate regularly, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And uh, most of them don't last a whole, a whole long. And that, you know, and that, that is true of a lot of things that we try to do when we're building new habits. And so in this episode, I want to talk about some hopefully practical ways to uh, create new habits, some things that you can do. And I'm going to talk about the psychological aspect of that. I, um, amongst other things, I am a coach. I take on clients from a coaching perspective. Um, You know, this is goes along with my shamanic practice and my teaching. And, you know, one of the things that I work with clients a lot on is how to create forward momentum. You know, whatever, in coaching, clients normally come with some kind of goal or something they want to alleviate. You know, I'm not happy with my job, I'm not happy with my home or my relationships or some aspect of their life they want to improve. And, um, you know, we can look at that from a spiritual perspective, but there's also the psychological and the behavioral perspective as well. 
how do we create the behaviors that will make being successful in whatever area, whatever realm, more automatic, easier, more likely to happen. And a lot of that centers around creating habits. Um, you know, we are, we are creatures of habit. You would think that creating habits would be extremely easy. We can get, you know, we can get addicted to cigarettes really easily. We can get addicted to sex and we can get addicted to alcohol, drugs, all kinds of things we can get addicted to so easily. Why isn't it, why isn't it easier to build healthy habits? Specifically today, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use meditation as an example because this is a spiritual podcast. Now, if you already have a meditation habit or a meditation practice that you do regularly, then this, it, it's not to say this podcast won't apply to you because you can take what I'm going to go through and apply it to something else in your life. But I wanted to give people something useful to work with, something useful to work on, if you didn't have something. If you want to build a habit, you know, doing something else, then uh, certainly the things I'm going to have to tell you today should apply to that as well. So this is going to be uh, probably one of the more practical podcasts where I'm not just going to, you know, sort of spread my opinion about things, although <laughs> there will be a fair amount of my opinion involved. I can't really prevent that from coming through. But um, let's say that you wanted to start to meditate or you have done some meditation and you want to make that a regular practice. And that would be a fantastic thing to do. The benefits of meditation are well studied um, from, you know, not even talking from a spiritual perspective, but from a mental and physical perspective. Meditation is fantastic. It lowers stress, lowers blood pressure, lowers inflammation, um, creates more psychological resilience, <clears throat> pardon me, it improves our relationships, it does all kinds of things, and there are uh, thousands upon thousands of studies of meditation out there that you can read for yourself and look at the benefits of meditation. So if you don't have a regular meditation practice, um, you know, you may want to think about that. It's one of the easiest things you can do for your health. And, um, you know, it doesn't cost anything, you know, unless you decide that you can take a meditation class, um, you know, that might cost something. Or you can, you know, go find YouTube videos on meditation or, you know, find guided meditations or whatever. Okay, but let's say you want to build a meditation practice. And so you want to meditate you set a goal, I'm going to meditate, I'm going to meditate an hour and a half every day. And how long does that last? Maybe a day, maybe two. And then you're like, oh, I don't have an hour and a half. I got up too late this morning. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll worry about that tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, you're like, oh, I really don't feel like this. I need to make my coffee. I'm having a sip of my coffee right now. Um... I need to make my coffee, I need to have my breakfast, and I'm running late again, I'm not going to meditate. In, in a couple days like that, the meditation practice is over, kaput, through, done, and we don't think about it again, maybe till next year. And, you know, don't, if this is you, if this is a pattern you have done, uh, don't beat yourself up over it, that's not the point of this podcast. What I'm saying is this is natural. This is how things go most of the time for most people, the vast majority of people, people who have New Year's resolutions, people who resolve to get fit or stop smoking or any of those things. Um, so those, you know, those habits can be 
<clears throat> challenging, particularly if we go around, you know, if we go around trying to add new habits or delete old habits, you know, without some idea of how habits are formed or putting some thought into actually creating the habit. So what happens most of the time is that we put a lot of thought into the what. What are we going to do? Uh, I'm going to work out for 45 minutes every day. But we don't actually think about, oh, you don't think about the perspective, I want to create a an exercise habit that will last me the rest of my life that will and and I will naturally get into shape. Like we think about the I'm going to fit into that bathing suit or I'm going to look this way or I'm going to lose this many pounds as the goal. And it's very frequently a large long-term large long-term goal. Um and there's nothing wrong with large long-term goals. I've got lots of large long-term goals. Uh, but trying to tackle that on day one is not great. And so, again, let me use meditation. Meditation is going to be the example I use throughout this episode um, because it because it is a spiritual, uh, spiritual, physical, and psychological practice, and it benefits everyone. And I'm also going to use a talk about a few myths of meditation that prevent people from practicing sometimes. Um, so that'll be sort of an allied topic along with uh, how to build healthy habits, consciously build healthy habits. So, you know, I talk to a lot of people and I, I uh, have from time to time teach meditation. And I've taught meditation online, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, I try to teach people how to create a meditation practice, which is essentially about building a habit. So what happens very frequently in my observation from talking to a lot of people about meditation is people say, okay, I'm going to start meditating. I'm going to sit down and close my eyes for an hour and I'm going to stop my thoughts and then I will be fully enlightened the very first time I try to meditate. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not a lot. So the number one complaint I hear from people who claim they can't meditate is, I can't stop my thoughts. My thoughts keep going. My response to that is, congratulations, you're alive. And your thoughts are never going to stop until you become the Buddha. So the bad news is you are not the Buddha yet. Part of you is, but you are not fully immersed in your Buddhahood at the moment. That's the bad news. The good news is you're alive and your consciousness is working and thoughts are arising and you're aware of them. Those are all good things, all good things to be expected. The goal of meditation is not to stop your thoughts. The goal is to meditate. That's it. The practice is the goal. The benefits that you get are side effects. The lower the blood pressure, the lower stress, all of those things, they may be goals of yours. They might be goals, oh, I'm going to meditate to reduce stress. I'm going to meditate to do this. But those things are side effects, right? It's like saying, I am going to work out to lose weight, okay? Losing weight is a side effect of working out. But if we shift our perspective a little bit and, you know, we say, I'm, I'm going to work out because I love, I'm going to find a way that I love at getting exercise. And I'm going to exercise just for the enjoyment of it. And I'm going to make sure I enjoy it every time I do it. You will very quickly build 
or at least start to build an exercise habit. And you will lose weight as a side effect if that, you know, is a goal of yours, as a side effect of working out. But if your end goal is, <clears throat> well, man, I got to lose 30 pounds and I'm going to go, I'm going to work out to lose 30 pounds. And you work out for a week and it's hard and you got to get up early in the morning and you got to drive to a gym and you got to put on weird clothes and shower in a weird place and do all these things. And then you look at the scale after a week and you've lost half a pound. And you're like, oh, at this rate, it's going to be more than a year before I lose all that weight. Might as well just go eat a large pizza topped with cupcakes and drink a two-liter bottle of soda to to wash it all down. Um, and again, I'm exaggerating, but this is what happens a lot. People, f- you know, and again, it's it's good, it's fine to have these big long-term goals, but one of the problems with, uh, one of the problems with, you know, setting these goals and building these habits is not seeing results quickly enough, right? Not seeing things happen, getting discouraged and giving up and breaking the habit too soon and that sort of thing, okay? So with, the me- with meditation, you know, um, I would say, and the same thing with exercise or anything else, I would say start small and set short-term goals. So if, if exercise were your goal, I'm going to exercise. My goal is to exercise for 30 minutes three times this week. That's much more doable than I'm going to exercise for an hour and a half every single day and I'm going to lose 30 pounds in the next two weeks and... Um, you know, we get discouraged a lot. And also, you know, large habits are challenging to install, right? We've got to make big, big changes, big lifestyle changes. We've got to buck against other habits to do these things. So one of the things that I work on with uh, clients when I coach them And they say, well, my goal is to, I don't know, find a new job. Let's say that that's the goal. Well, you know, we, one of the first things I'll do is to, you know, try to get people into momentum, get people moving, you know, and it's hard. You know, if you think about, um, Think about the way momentum and inertia works. Okay, you have a car. You can't go zero to 100 miles an hour instantaneously. You have to, you know, apply the gas and it speeds up over time, right? You're overcoming the inertia of the car sitting still. Same's kind of true with yourself. Like you have to overcome some inertia, now, I trained martial arts for decades and taught martial arts for a long time. And one of the things that my uh, one of my teachers told me was the hardest part of training is getting off the couch. And isn't that the truth? I would um, see people, you know, come to class for a week and then not show up again. And what happens is, oh, we're comfortable you know, oh, there's something good on TV, oh, uh, I'm hungry, oh, you know, we'll find all of those things that get in our way, get in our way. So what I will um, work on with clients frequently is, and this will be my first major tip for building any sort of healthy habit, but I'll apply it to meditation in a moment, um, is you know, I'll ask the question, what is the smallest thing you could do right now 
that would move you forward towards your goal. And that thing should be so small that it would seem almost ridiculous not to do it. I will give you an example from a client, and I don't give away my client's name or an, uh, any identifiable information, so I won't tell you where this person lived or anything about them, but um, I had a client who is um, a fantastic photographer, and uh, she was working in a job that was not what exactly what she wanted, and we talked about her goals, her dreams, all of these things, and she really wanted to have you know, see her work hanging in a gallery somewhere. And that would be a really cool kind of long-term goal for her. And I said, well, you know, what are you, what are you doing about that right now? She said, well, I don't even know my camera. I haven't even taken pictures in a year. My camera's in the back of my closet. My photos are all on hard drives and storage and this and that. And I said, you know, asked her the question, what is the smallest thing that you could do to move your goal forward that is so small it would seem almost silly not to do it? And she said, well, I guess I could take my camera out of the closet. I was like, cool, take your camera out of the closet. And then the next step was, I guess I could put my camera in the car whenever I go out. And so if I have an opportunity... I can, you know, go take some pictures somewhere. You know, if I have some time, if I see something that catches my eye, I'll have my camera right there. And so she did that. Um, A couple things happened. So she started, you know, she did all of those things and she started taking some cool pictures. And in her day job, so to speak, she ran into somebody who ran a gallery who was putting on a show of new artists. And she said, wow, that's really interesting. I'm a photographer. And they got talking. And long story short, she had within, within three months of us talk, you know, having that initial conversation, she had booked her first gallery show. Um, you know, and this is, this takes nothing away from her skill as a photographer. She was always a brilliant photographer. It was just a matter of, it was a matter of a number of things. One, she was demonstrating on a spiritual level, she was demonstrating to herself and to the universe what she wanted. You know, and one of the problems with the law of attraction stuff out that's out there is, A lot of people take the law of attraction to mean I just sit around on my couch and wish really hard, and when I do, the universe is going to drop a box of money into my lap. And if it worked that way, we would all win the lottery, right? We'd all be billionaires. Um, It doesn't work that way, I'm sorry to say. The love attraction is wonderful and it's a fantastic practice and it does, you know, follow some accurate spiritual principles and that sort of thing. But frequently it omits action. It omits doing something, you know. And I think people have the idea that, oh, if I'm actually doing something, I'm not using the law of attraction, which is just not true. Um You know, the law of attraction is meant to make things, meant to create enhanced probabilities. We'll put it that way. So if, you know, I'm using law of attraction to get a new job, but I don't put my resume out there or I don't look for jobs or I don't interview, a new job isn't going to, you know, a new job isn't going to um, jump into my lap. So, you know, it's 
it's a false idea that you're just going to sit around and wish real hard and things are going to happen for you. And I'm sorry to say that that's a false idea, but, but it is. And um, people will be better served by getting into inspired action and actually doing things towards their goals. So this client of mine got into inspired action. She took some very small steps that led to huge results, but she took steps and she'd been, she'd had this goal, this thing in mind that she wanted to happen for her for years, maybe decades, I don't know, but for a very long time, years and years. But she didn't do anything about it. Okay. And so stuff isn't just going to happen for you. You're not going to um, lose weight if that's your goal, lose body fat. If you um, sit around and think real hard about it while you're eating two pizzas and a chocolate cake every day, okay, because your actions are going to run contrary to your to your mind and spirit. And your mind's not, if you're doing those things, your mind is not quite aligned either. So... Alignment is really about getting body, mind, and spirit moving in the same direction. So having these goals, like why do you want to work out? Why do you want to meditate? Why do you want to do these things? That is important. Having the why is important, you know, but... Not as important as getting into motion, getting into action. It's funny saying getting into action with meditation because you're kind of doing the opposite. But sitting down to meditate is taking the action. So the key here is, particularly at the beginning of any habit or change you want to make, do small things. So... If I had gone to my client, well, if you want your own show, you need to spend three hours a day taking photographs and two hours a day editing those photographs and another hour a day um, marketing yourself to different galleries and, you know, spend every Saturday walking from gallery to gallery with your portfolio. Um, I don't think she would have been able to sustain that for very long. It's too big a change. It's too much to ask. Um, And yeah, I know. I mean, there are some people out there that make huge changes and never look back. But that's pretty rare. For most people, again, most uh, New Year's resolutions, I think 85% go by the wayside within the first couple of months. So I'm trying to um, give some tips for the rest of us for whom these large changes don't tend not to stick. So make small changes. So with meditation, when I've had people come to me with a goal of creating a meditation habit, I will tell them a couple of things. One is don't sit down and try to meditate for an hour and a half. If you have not meditated before, it's going to drive you crazy. You know, you wouldn't, if you've never worked out before, you wouldn't go to the gym for two hours and lift the heaviest weights you possibly could, you know, to the point of exhaustion. You would never go back to the gym again. You would most likely injure yourself. And the amount of soreness you would feel would keep you out of the gym for quite a long time, probably, if you ever went back. So, so start with small actions, okay? If your goal is to start a meditation habit, start with, I am going to sit on my cushion for a minute and a half with my eyes closed. And that's it. That's it. That's how it would start. You're like, yeah, but I'm not enlightened when I sit just by sitting down for three minutes. Sure. Sure but you're not enlightened by sitting down on your mat for the first time for two hours either. And you're probably not going to stick with meditation if that's how you're trying to do it. So that's, uh, that's step number one 
uh, chunk things down into smaller steps and build over time. So I've told people, you know, if you're starting meditation practice, don't start with longer than five minutes if you're just beginning. There's no reason for it. And then, you know, after about five minutes or so, you're just fighting with your brain anyway. You've got to get some practice under your belt and say that your your brain starts to go, oh, okay, we've done this before. I'm not going to fight with you. This is safe. This is okay. So small chunks. Um, You know, a couple of the other things I'm going to suggest come from some research on habits, good habits, bad habits, all of that sort of thing. Um, And that's one of them, chunking out small things. The other, uh, another good tip for creating habits, uh, you know, and this goes along with chunking them into smaller things, is when you have a new habit that you want to create, let's say I want to drink more water. I'm going to start by drinking an extra glass a day of water. I am going to chain that habit to something I already do habitually. So I brush my teeth in the morning and at night at the same time. So I am going to add a glass of water to my tooth brushing routine in the morning. I'll start out with that. Okay. So every time I brush my teeth right before I pick up my toothbrush, I'm going to drink a glass of water. And then I'm going to brush my teeth. Or I'll do it after I brush my teeth. doesn't matter. But I'm chaining that to something that's already in a habitual behavior. And then I might add a second glass of water to my nighttime teeth brushing routine. So whenever you can, you chain this to a habit. So you're taking advantage of patterns that you've already built up. So with meditation, it might be, you know, um, whenever I get out of bed and, uh, you know, put my shoes on. Before I put my shoes on, I'm going to sit down on my mat for five minutes, close my eyes, and watch my breath. And then I'll put my shoes on. Or, you know, whatever. Whatever thing that you do every time in the morning. So for me, I make my coffee. Maybe I meditate for five minutes before I, before I actually drink my coffee. I'm going to have a sip right now. Very good coffee this morning, um, if I don't say so myself. Okay, so that is uh, hint number two. So hint number one was small, 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 small behaviors. What's the smallest thing you could do? Hint number two is to chain the behavior to other habits that you already have. Take advantage of those neural pathways that are burned in. Um, Hint number three is to reduce resistance to performing your habit. So resistance is anything that blocks us emotionally, physically, whatever, but usually emotionally, talking usually about emotional resistance, to um, to performing a task. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, and, and I got this from, I was listening to a story on NPR the other day, and the woman was, in fact, talking about habits. She had written a book about habits, I think called like Good Habits, Bad Habits, or something like that. But I, you know, th- this one came up, uh, this statistic came up, I knew... I knew that overcoming resistance was one of the keys to to creating habits, but I didn't know this particular statistic. So they did a study of people with gym memberships and how often they use them. So somebody who lived within three miles of their gym, so they had to drive three miles to go work out at the gym, three miles or less, on average used the gym and worked out three to five times per month, which doesn't seem like a lot. However, once you crossed five miles, once somebody had to travel five miles, 
the number of times they worked out or you you know used the gym on average fell to once per month so that two extra miles of resistance which you know is a few extra minutes of driving you know reduced the you know usage to a third or a fifth of what people normally would be normally would be doing and that tells you how strong a factor resistance is so how you know how do we go about reducing resistance to a new behavior well let's say it's um meditation look at the things that stop you or the things you have to do to meditate or that sort of thing so you might say well you know when i meditate i've got to go you know put on special clothes and i've got to um, get my cushions out and set them up and dim the lights and da 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 you know whatever okay well let's say you have to wear special comfy clothes to meditate um, and you want to meditate in the morning, maybe at night you lay out your meditation clothes for the morning. And maybe you set your cushion out. So when you get up in the morning, you can put on your comfy meditation clothes and just go sit on your mat. Or maybe you've linked that to brushing your teeth. Maybe you put your comfy clothes on, brush your teeth, and go sit on your mat and meditate for five minutes. And thus, you can link a bunch of behaviors together, right? So pre-brushing your teeth, you put on your comfy clothes. I don't change my clothes to meditate. Um, maybe you do, and that's fine, but I'm just using this as an example. I meditate in whatever I happen to be wearing at the time. And... But anyway, it, it is all about reducing your resistance. So if you want to work out, you know, um, maybe don't you, you know, you've a lot of people have, you know, buy the piece of workout equipment, the treadmill or the whatever, and they set up in their house and then they use it as a clothes rack, right? There's stuff all over it and that sort of thing. And then like, oh, I've got to, you know, if I want to use a treadmill, I've got to clean it off. And that's resistance. Keep your treadmill clean. Keep your meditation cushion out and available where you can just sit and meditate. Link it to another habit. So the three tips we have so far are small chunks. Um, linking to another habit. And reducing resistance. And you can figure out how each of those things works for you. The last kind of, the last hint I have, and this one can be, you know, a little bit more challenging, I guess. Um, and that is that um, this has to do with brain chemistry, particularly dopamine. So dopamine is the chemical that is associated with reward in our brain, our sense of being rewarded. And we can get a rush of dopamine from different ways. Frequently, alcohol and drugs, um, you know, the addiction aspect is an addiction to dopamine. Eating, you know, those sorts of things. And, um, you know, if you have low dopamine levels, you know, it can be problematic. You get things like Parkinson's disease and that, that sort of thing. So there are, you know, there are different ways to naturally increase your dopamine levels. Meditation is one of them. So meditation, as long as it can be, um, you know, as long as it's a pleasant, positive experience, will actually increase your dopamine levels. So it can be a reward unto itself. But some of the other things, so we want to perhaps um, link 
increases in dopamine. You know, we want to do things that naturally increase our dopamine. Um, so there are things that, you know, like you can eat certain things. You'll do research on your own. Um, changing your diet, getting enough sleep, meditating, um, eating you know, eating good proteins, that sort of thing. And you can, you can look up sort of the dietary things as well. Um, but some of the other things that, you know, release dopamine for us, um, you know, do increase moderate, you know, are, blah, pardon me, a little tongue tied there. Some of the things that release or increase dopamine for us include sort of like short bursts of exercise, so, like, moderate intensity exercise does it. So, if you do it too much, you know, not great, but, like, 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. Getting enough sleep. When you get enough sleep, there's a lot of dopamine released in the morning. Um, but we can also potentially link habits to um, things, that, things that release dopamine as well. So I already said that meditation in, in and of itself can release dopamine, but so can things like listening to pleasant music. So maybe you find music that you play when you meditate that you really enjoy. Okay. Um, maybe if you're working out, you listen to, you know, a lot of people listen to music on a treadmill or that sort of thing. Um, I've already said meditation, um, you know, frequently food, uh, food, you know, eating something will be a, eating something we like will improve dopamine. So, but we want to be careful about eating something unhealthful an unhealthful way. But maybe you could, uh, I don't know, as an example, reward yourself with a very small piece of dark chocolate, for example, which has, you know, even though there's some sugar and it has some health benefits and releases really happy chemicals in our brain. So, you know, you have a rule. I have a tiny piece of dark chocolate after I meditate. Just as one example of how to do a dopamine dopamine release with your hap- habit. So, triggering your reward system. Or, you know, I'm only going to, you know, I enjoy watching this trashy TV program. I'm only going to watch it after I've meditated. I've got it, you know, you've got it recorded on DVR or something. And I've got to meditate for 15 minutes before I allow myself to watch this trashy guilty pleasure TV show or whatever. You can think of things that you find rewarding that you can use to link to habits. And this will increase, as we know, uh, rewarding behavior leads to those that behavior increasing and rewards that release dopamine uh, enhance that enhance the habit building effect so those are some very real world i hope practical things you can do to create to create habits and i know i'm specifically I was specifically focused on meditation habit for this, but it can be anything. But I do want to talk a little tiny bit about meditation at the end of this, since um, if you're if you're listening, perhaps you're interested in in creating a meditation routine for yourself, building a meditation habit, and that is a really healthy body, mind, and spirit health thing for you to do if you so decide, if you so choose. Um, and I, So I want to, as somebody who has taught meditation for a while, I want to give you a few pointers, hints, things that hold people back when they start meditating. Um, first of all, there are, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of meditation methods out there. And so no one meditation method fits every person. So you might have to try some different ones to see which ones work for you. And you might start with some guided, if you've never done it before, start with some guided meditation. 
that can be if you don't really don't know what to do. Um, I've talked about the number one complaint that I get about meditation. I can't stop my thoughts. Um, don't make that a goal. Don't think that you're going to stop your thoughts. Think I, Instead, think I'm going to observe my thoughts. I'm going to become aware of thoughts as they arise. I'm going to identify less with my thoughts and watch them and allow them to pass through my consciousness like clouds through the sky. That's really what meditation is about, not stopping your thoughts. Now, as you get better with meditation, your thoughts will slow down. They will become less impactful. They might stop for short periods of time. You might get bursts of energy, all kinds of things. Again, these are side effects. These are, you know, pleasant side effects. They're good. They're good things that happen, but... You can't push for that, especially right out of the gate. I can't meditate because my mind is too busy. I can't stop my thoughts. Don't stop your thoughts. That doesn't mean you can't meditate. That's crazy. Um, And then the other, the other, you know, the other complaint is the time thing. Oh, I just don't have time, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's got five minutes. Everybody has five minutes. You have five minutes. You're listening to this podcast. You know, and yeah, you might be doing something else. You might be listening in the car, or listening while you're doing something else. But chances are you can find five minutes in your day after you brush your teeth or, you know, before you settle down to go to sleep at night. My guess is you don't jump out of bed the second your alarm goes off. And run around and are absolutely busy until you fall asleep. Most people do not operate like that. If you do, you're probably not going to be healthy for very long. As your, you know, your body can't stay active, your body and mind can't stay active, that active all day long. So, again, you know, view it as uh, something... View meditation itself, and this could be another hint as well, as a reward for a busy day, perhaps, or a reward for something else. Ooh. And, you know, change how you think about, oh, I have to meditate today. I have to do it. Change the, um, you know, change the way you're talking to yourself about it. Instead of, I have to meditate today. I need to meditate today. I should meditate today. How about... I get to meditate today. I'm so excited. I have the privilege of meditating today. I have the luxury. I have the reward of meditating today. Make it a positive thing and not a chore. Do it for the love of it. The rewards will come. The rewards are side effects. You know, they say that, you know, the the old expression, the journey is the destination Meditation is the example of that, is the prime example of that. Make meditation the goal. Ooh, if I, you know, I get to meditate at the end of today, I'm looking forward to that. And when I was younger, I used to meditate a lot more. Um, I, you know, would meditate uh, for at least a half an hour when I woke up in the morning and at least a half an hour before I went to bed and then usually for some length of time in between. Um, I do not meditate that frequently anymore, although I absolutely love to meditate. But it was something that I absolutely looked forward to. It felt so good to meditate. And it can. It can as long as you reduce the resistance to it. As long as you reduce the chatter about the chatter, right? Am I thinking? Am I thinking? I've got to stop thinking. I can't stop thinking. No, just let the thoughts come. Just watch them. I'll probably do a whole program on meditation at some point. Um, I have... 
I've taught a lot of meditation in my days. I have a lot of, I have a lot of opinions about it. Um, uh, but you know, you, you don't need a specific method. There's no method of meditation that's better, you know, that is globally better. You know, there, there are some that work better for some people and some that work better for others. And, you know, some meditation is religious, meaning, you know, you would have to be of a specific faith to get the most benefit out of it. And that might not be appropriate for you. Or you might want to meditate as a, you know, as part of your faith. And so you would look to your faith tradition for that. So anyway, um, I am going to wrap this up. I hope you are having a uh, fantastic new year and I hope you're stay happy and healthy and look forward to what 2022 has to bring. Um, there will be, there are changes coming, changes, changes for the good for everyone. And um, let's bring more love and light into the world this year. Hope this has been helpful and I will talk to you very, very soon. been listening to Speaking Spirit with your host, John Moore. For more info or to contact John, go to mainshaman.com. That's M-A-I-N-E-S-H-A-M-A-N.com.